Well, when I started uh, my graduate work in, in genetics, the big question was, what on earth is this gene? How can it do these amazing things that it does? And it was a complete mystery. That was the big question. That was the question that attracted me to genetics and that made me want to spend my life trying to get an answer or to get part of the answer. By that time, a lot was known about how genes are uh, transmitted and heredity and uh, some of the things that they, they control, but uh, nothing was known about the physical or chemical structure that was responsible for what the gene could do. And it seemed very inaccessible and very hard to get at. And, uh, and that was the, the question that was mostly on my mind, to find a way to work that would help to decide what the gene was like and what it was, how it could do what it was doing. I was working with bacteria. And bacteria had become a very good material to work with for genetics. Because uh, in 1943, while I was a graduate student, for the first time, it became clear that bacteria had genes like other organisms. Before that, the bacteri bacteriologists were telling us that bacteria just change with the environment. When it was established that they have regular genes and that they can be used for genetic experiments, that's when I decided that I wanted to work with bacteria. I was just beginning the research for my PhD. And I had planned to do it with the fruit fly which was the standard organism in genetics, and a wonderful little bug. And I was going to try to understand how uh, radiation induces mutations in, in uh, fruit fly, Drosophila. When I read that paper uh, proving that bacteria have genes, I really got excited and thought that would be a wonderful material to work with. I mean, they multiply every 20 minutes, and you can hold a billion of them in a little test tube. And so just think how many generations you can work with in, in a very short time. So uh, that's when my advisor at Columbia, uh, Professor Dobzhansky, uh, saw how excited I was about this new development using bacteria for genetics. He suggested that I might want to do my PhD research with E. coli instead of Drosophila. And that's why he, he sent me to Cold Spring Harbor for the summer uh, to learn how to work with bacteria. Uh, Luria and Delbrook were the ones who had discovered that bacteria had genes, and they were going to be there at Cold Spring Harbor that summer. And uh, so I, I did go, and uh, uh, that was one of the uh, most fortunate events in my working life that, that I connected with Cold Spring Harbor. Because it turned out I actually stayed there for, for 11 years. I had a kind of beginner's luck, I think. The very first experiment I did, I had no idea what I was doing. I, uh, the director at, at the laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor handed me a culture of E. coli, a test tube, and he pointed to an ultraviolet lamp and said, uh, go, do mu induce mutations. So I had to sort of uh, feel my way about how to work with these bugs. I watched other people and saw what, how they worked. And I started my very first experiment, and uh, the first thing I needed to do was to decide what dose of ultraviolet light to use, because there were no published, um, there was no published information about that. So I was stabbing in the dark at the first try. And in my first try, I uh, overdid the dose. I used doses much too high. And the next day, when I looked at my Petri dishes, I found that I had put a million bacteria on the surface of each of them, and the next day, nobody grew. There was nothing on any of the plates, except one Petri dish had four colonies growing on it. So four bacteria out of the million that I had put on that Petri dish had somehow survived this very high dose. And it occurred to me that maybe those four were mutants resistant to radiation. Because in Cold Spring Harbor at that point, there were, was a lot of talk about resistance. Uh, Dr. Demeritz was working on resistance to penicillin, which had just been discovered. And there was resistance to this, that, and the other that people were working on. 
And so I thought, well, maybe they were, why did they survive just four bacteria out of millions? And I cultured them and tested them, and sure enough, they could withstand at least 100 times more radiation, both ultraviolet light and later we found also x-rays, than the parent strain. It turned out to be a clue to a whole new area that I was just starting to work on. And it led me to understanding that ultraviolet light uh, does a lot more than just induce mutations. It uh, activates uh, what we, know, we now know uh, uh, to be 43 genes, at least 43 different genes in E. coli, that are quiet and silent when the cell is healthy, but are uh, suddenly activated and start uh, turning out their product uh, when the uh, DNA is damaged by radiation or some other agents. My first mutation sort of led me into perceiving that this was going on. And it was a discovery of what we call the SOS response in E. coli, which implies that it's a, a life-saving mechanism, which it is indeed. Because of the activities that are turned on by these uh, genes that are activated by the damage uh, promote the repair of the damage and the survival of the cell in a variety of different ways, and the survival of the population, actually. And I think that my experience in Cold Spring Harbor uh, was what sort of uh, softened me up to think in terms of repair, because one of the people I met in Cold Spring Harbor was a scientist named Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize in her 80s, I think, for the amazing work she did in genetics. It was a pleasure to get to know her, and one of the things I remember best about being in Cold Spring Harbor was that many times that I spent in Barbara McClintock's laboratory looking over her shoulder and watching her work, when she was making her major discovery, when she found that genes actually can move from one location to another, this was very revolutionary. We always thought that the chromosome was very stable and genes stayed put, but she showed that they can jump and they can have important effects when they do. At any rate, one of the things that Barbara uh, was working on, and she talked about this at our, at our uh, meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, she was studying how chromosomes join together when they're broken because chromosomes can break uh, as a result of uh, various treatments. And when they do, she noticed that they come together very rapidly. The broken ends join. And uh, she was very puzzled about how that could work, but she, she did uh, make, make a point of saying that they could find, the broken ends could find each other over a long distance, very completely different parts of the nucleus. They would sort of aim at each other. It was a, seemed to be a force that was bringing them together. And uh, since genes are on chromosomes, and uh, the chromosomes are being repaired when they're broken, it seemed to me that there must be some molecular kind of repair going on inside the chromosome that would have involve repairing the genes. So I think that exposure to the, uh, the way broken chromosomes are repaired uh, made me think in terms of repair when I was considering what was happening in irradiated bacteria. Before the DNA is damaged, let's say by radiation, uh, the DNA is quietly replicating itself, copying itself. and. Uh, when DNA is damaged uh, by ultraviolet light, for instance, which changes one of the elements of the DNA and stops the replication, the enzymes that are copying the DNA cannot get by that damaged spot. So the whole thing stops. And that's lethal if nothing happens, because uh, if the replication is stopped and there's nothing that can restart it, that's the end of that cell. Uh, but we learned later that E. coli and all cells, including human cells, have developed repair mechanisms that can 
uh, in various ways take care of that damage and get rid of it one way or another. There are a number of different ways to do it. And usually they work very efficiently and the damage just goes away and the replication continues. And that happens, uh, in, in, as I say, in a number of ways. For instance, if you shine visible light on the E. coli after it's been damaged by ultraviolet, uh, that will take care of getting rid of the damage. The visible light splits that lump that's sitting on the DNA and makes it go away. So that's an immediate repair. And then there's another repair mechanism that's called the cut and patch mechanism, actually excision repair, which detects the uh, damaged spot, cuts one strand of the DNA on one side of the damage, cuts on the other side, and thereby removes a small piece of the DNA containing the damage. And that leaves a gap. See, DNA has two strands. So there's one strand that's still intact, and the other one has a piece taken out of it by this cut and patch mechanism. And then another enzyme comes along and fills in that patch using the information on the other strand to do it accurately. So that's another repair mechanism that acts very quickly and that takes care of most of the damage that happens. But sometimes there's a kind of damage that cannot be easily repaired by these mechanisms. And that's where the SOS response happens. So here you have damage sitting on the DNA, which the invisible light couldn't help and the cut and patch couldn't help for some reason. And then what happens is the stalled replication, the place where the replication has stopped, generates a signal that says SOS basically. And then uh, a number of things happen. I can't really describe them in great detail. But the two strands of DNA come apart into a sort of a bubble. And that's the signal for the SOS system is single-stranded DNA, which normally doesn't occur in the happily replicating DNA. But the single strands bubbling out cause another molecule to come and bind those single strands. And that sets off a sequence which leads to turning on 43 genes. You know, there were a lot of people involved that I haven't mentioned other people, but the SOS response was a, a, a joint work. And this was a, a, a young man whose name was Miroslav Rodman. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. And uh, I had written a paper in which I suggested that ultraviolet light was inducing two different uh, consequences in a similar way that sounded as if they were being induced together. And uh, Radman, uh, a few years later, had linked two other ultraviolet effects and suggested that they were both induced by the same signal. And one of them was the same one that I had linked. So we, we both linked A, I had linked it to B, and he had linked it to C. And when we met, uh, I guess it was in 1972, he had just uh, described his end of this. And uh, so we met and we put together this uh, observation that I had linked two events that were caused by UV and said that they were induced together, and he had linked two others, and one of them was the common one. So there we had three different ultraviolet effects that we thought were induced in a common uh, way by a single uh, signal. And that was really the beginning. And by the way, Radman was the one who introduced the term SOS. And it was used in the sense of the international distress signal. So in a way, our putting together our two separate pieces of this began the SOS response to be appreciated. It was a great joy to be part of the group that was working on DNA repair. I mean, it was a small international group. They must have been probably, I'd say, 30 or 35 individual scientists and the group of students around them and so on. 
who were trying to understand how the DNA changes and how it's repaired and, and uh, all of that. And being part of that group was one of the most joyful experiences I ever had in science because it was a group of people with a very common set of goals. And uh, I sometimes hear these days that there's a lot of competitiveness in science. It doesn't ring a bell with the way it was in my experience at all. We've shared our information, we shared our strains, we uh, cheered for each other when somebody made an important discovery. And it was a human experience that was extremely satisfying. And uh, when I look back on my work, that, that's a big part of, of why I'm glad I did science.